check of our lighting. Fantastic. All right, we're ready to get started. Hi, everybody. We're so happy you're here. Um, we are here today for our live stream program with Streamable Learning and Museum of the Rockies. My name is Angie Weikert, and I'll be your host for today. Uh, before we get started, let's talk about a couple important things to know about the platform that we're using, Zoom. You have two ways to interact with us. You all have just been using the chat box. So you can use that feature if we ask you a question, you can type into that chat box and respond. The other way you can interact with us is the Q&A area or question and answer area. There are so many of you in the chat room that if you have a question you want to ask us, go ahead and use that Q&A area and we'll, make, we'll get to as many questions as we can. Before we get started, um, I wanted to give you a brief intro to where we're at. We're at Museum of the Rockies, Bozeman, Montana, and although our museum is temporarily closed to the public, we're here today uh, because Jordy has to come in and take care of these animals every day. And we'll introduce you to him in just a minute. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and step off camera here and zoom in and share my screen so you'll be able to see some slides here in just a second. Fantastic. All right, so uh, we have an exhibit from Clyde Peeling's Reptiland in Allenwood, Pennsylvania. So um, here's where we are at Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman. Um, and Jordy's coming to us from Pennsylvania. He's staying here in Bozeman with us for a while. Museum of the Rockies is in the uh, beautiful Gallatin Valley. We're just north of Yellowstone National Park. And here is what our entrance looks like. Now, the grass isn't quite that green yet. Uh, it's a little rainy here today, but we're hoping for that green grass to pop up real soon. Here's the exhibit that we're inside. So at Museum of the Rockies, we bring in changing exhibits from around the world. Um, and this exhibit, Reptiles, the Beautiful and the Deadly, has live species of reptiles, which you'll get the chance to meet a few of them in just a minute. We hope that when you when we open back up to the public, if you're here near us um, in Montana, that you get to come and see all of the amazing reptiles on display. So with that, um, I would like to introduce our, our guest for today. We have Jordy from Clyde Feelings Reptiland, who's here with us in Bozeman, taking care of all of these animals. Uh, Jordy's gonna talk to us today about snakes. Yep. Thanks for being here, Jordy. No problem, happy to do it. So, as she said, my name is Zoo, or is Jordy. I am a zookeeper from Clyde Peeling's Reptiland, and Reptiland is located in the middle of central Pennsylvania, so it's a very far, long way away. But we focus mostly on reptiles, and this exhibit is like a mini traveling zoo. We have tons of different reptiles for you to see, about 15 different species, but today we're only going to be talking about the snakes. So that, we'll go ahead and take a look at our slide and just jump right on into it, because we got a lot of information to cover today. So, First, we have to start with the question, what is a reptile? Now, if you guys logged in yes, or last week and saw our, my talk about crocodilians, you know we covered this a little bit, but I'm gonna do a quick overview because at the end of this, you'll have an opportunity to do a little bit of a quiz and find out how, if you learned anything and how much you me memorize. So, these are the important things to know about what is a reptile. One, they are all covered in scales. It is a material very similar to your fingernails that covers their body completely. It gives them a lot of extra protection. Now you can see that is a great example is the guy on the top of these, uh, this little trilogy of pictures here. The top is a juvenile Jackson's chameleon. And you can see all the individual scales on him. And then we go down to the Right, yes, so over to the right, we have a tiny little wood turtle hatching out of an egg because all reptiles are hatched from eggs. This term is called oviparous. Ova meaning egg, paris meaning birth. So they are all going to be hatching from eggs in one way or another. Now they're not gonna hatch necessarily from hard calcium, really rigid eggs like birds. Some of them will, but a lot of them lay soft leathery eggs that the animals have to hatch out of. And then if we go over to the left, you'll see our beautiful Cuban rock iguana Guanji from back at the zoo. He is basking in the nice warm sun because reptiles are endothermic, meaning that they bask on a nice warm warm sun or kind of have to cool themselves in a pool, they can't regulate their internal body temperature like us mammals can. And because of that, we have to eat 
a lot to keep in our energy up to stay nice and warm. But reptiles don't have to do that because they rely on their environment to keep their body temperature up. Because of that, they eat way, way less. Most of the snakes that you're gonna be seeing on this exhibit only eat one food item every two weeks. That is it. That would be like us eating a whole, maybe a whole chicken once every month. It is that long, but they are built to go long periods of time between foods because snakes are the most energy conservationist animals out there. Now, that being said, what is a snake or what makes a snake a snake? So, we're gonna, <laughs> I know what my slides are. So what we have right here is our reptile family tree because we have to ask what is a snake and what is their closest living relative? Now, last week when I talked about crocodilians, I briefly mentioned that crocodilians are really closely related to birds because they are a part of the group or the family known as the archosaurs, which make up the dinosaurs, the pterosaurs, and the crocodilians. And over millions of years, the dinosaurs became the birds. We're not talking about that today. Instead, we're focusing on the other branch. As you can see, we have multiple groups of reptiles here, and we're gonna focus on the snakes. But if you look closely, you can see that snakes are really closely related to lizards. And that's because they're part of the order known as squamata, or makes them squamates. So lizards and snakes are one and the same practically. And snakes are just really, 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 really well evolutionarily advanced uh, lizards in a way. They have lots of things that make them very, very unique. Because the traits of a, uh, of a snake have, or there's lots of different things that make a snake different from a lizard. Now, one of the big things a lot of people like to say is that the difference between a lizard and a snake is their legs, then the lack thereof. But that's not always the case because there are actually legless lizards. And there are also examples of some species of snakes having vestigial limbs of legs near their rear end. That means they have evolutionary leftovers from the days when snakes used to have legs. What really defines a snake is a couple of things. One, you are never, ever, 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 ever going to beat a snake at a staring contest because they are never going to blink. Now, we have to blink because we gotta keep our eyeballs nice and moist and we have eyelids to be able to do that. But snakes don't have to blink, but they still have eyeballs. They still gotta keep them moist. And they're able to do that thanks to the special scales that cover their eyeball completely called an eye cap. And these allow them to always be staring. So even when you see a snake, you can't really tell if they're asleep or if they're awake because their eyes are always open watching to be awoken by any level of motion around them. Snakes also have absolutely no ears whatsoever. They can't hear a darn thing. Now, technically, they do have internal ears, so they can feel vibrations, but they can't hear any sounds. I can shout as loud as I want at Mr. Weston right here, and he's not gonna care because he's not gonna react. He doesn't care because he can't hear a single thing. So all snakes are deaf. No snake can blink because they all have the eye caps. Snakes also have to always swallow their food whole. They're able to do that thanks to their special skull. Now, if you were to feel your lower jaw right now, you're gonna feel it is pretty much one thick solid bone but that is not the case with snakes. Snakes have two bones that can make up their jaw, but it can stretch at the chin and disarticulate at the hinges, allowing them to swallow up to three times the thickest part of their body. That would be like me swallowing an entire Thanksgiving turkey whole. It would probably be horrifying for everybody to watch, but it would be really delicious for me and would allow me to go really long periods of time between meals. If you eat a large meal, those of you who have eaten a ton during Thanksgiving probably have felt the experience where you wake up the next day and you feel like you don't need to eat anything. Well, that's what snakes are like, only way, way, way longer. Now, speaking of how they eat, we also have to talk about the fact that in my opinion, snakes are the most perfect predators out there. Evolutionarily speaking, they are perfect. One, they don't have any legs. This allows them to easily crawl into tighter enclosed spaces that animals with legs might not be able to get into. Two, they also, two, they also have a forked tongue or a biforked tongue. This allows them to flip their tongue into the air and smell the air. What they're doing right there is they're picking up tiny, tiny little molecules of food in the air, and their brain can tell them if there was more food on the right side of the fork 
or the left side of the fork. this means a snake could be completely blinded and still find food with intense accuracy just from that tongue alone. now they do still have nostrils, they do have a pretty good sense of smell, so that also helps out a lot and they have very effective methods of killing their food as well. and ah so we there are three methods of killing their food in the snake world. the first method is constriction. i was right. okay so there is constriction. constriction is the act fact in constriction is the act of a snake grabbing onto its prey, wrapping its body around and squeezing tightly. now a big misconception is that with constriction animals are crushing their bones and the organs of their prey or they're suffocating the animal, preventing them from breathing out. but that is not actually the case. constriction is actually what uh, is actually cutting off circulation in the circulatory system. so it's cutting off fresh blood and oxygen from going to the brain of the animal. and when the brain doesn't have any blood or oxygen, the animal kind of falls asleep and never wakes up. so it's a very effective, very uh, uh, commonly used measure used by a lot of different animals, including my first friend that I'm going to show off on the show here. so what we have right here, let's see if I can get close to the camera here. so what we have right here is a beautiful ball python. This fellow is named Archibald because he's a ball python. Ball pythons are a species that are found in Africa and they are strict carnivores as all snakes are. But these guys are constrictors and you can sort of see that by looking how big and muscular and strong and round that body is. This is just pure muscle. This guy can be very effective when he's killing his prey. He'll grab on, wrap around and squeeze incredibly tightly. their favorite foods that they love to eat include rodents, birds, but they will on occasion also eat things like lizards as well. but they don't really want to eat any kind of snake too often, but mostly it's going to be those birds and uh, birds and mammals that they're going to enjoy eating. Uh, they like I said they are extremely muscular, but that also allows them to crawl really really effectively. now this guy is also a great example of showing how snakes really move really well. so if he's going to work with me here a little bit, I can show off the belly muscle. so watch what happens when I run my finger right down his belly. if he's going to work with me. let's see. all right. so we're looking great. all right. so as you can see, it's hard to see. what he's doing right there is he is moving his belly muscles really really well. he is going to be using those muscles kind of like if you were to see if I stand back. if you were to go like like this with your belly. that's kind of like what you see that here. okay. if you're kind of go like this with your belly, it's kind of the same thing with snakes, only they have belly muscles running the entire length of their body which allows them to propel themselves or push themselves across the ground. not all snakes are going to be using this belly kind of crawling movement. some snakes will also use a method where they move their bodies back and forth and very rapidly in order to move effectively. all right. so move on, put him back. Jordi, while you're putting um, him away, yes. how many snakes do we have in this uh, in the Museum of the Rockies right now? great question. one, two, three, four, five, six species of snakes. yes. <laughs> okay. so the next method of killing prey in the snake world, so you have constriction. you also have what we kind of dub brute force. now this is really hard to kind of explain how it's different from constriction, but it's uh, right. I have pictures of our other animals that we have constrictors on this exhibit. going back a little bit to constrictors. the first image you saw was of our reticulated python we have on display. and then we also have our green tree python right there. both of them are constrictors, meaning they're going to grab their prey around. now this green tree python only wants to eat mice about so big about every uh, every two weeks. while that reticulated python, which is on the next slide, the reticulated python eats one rabbit about this big. he eats one rabbit once a month and that is perfectly good. so excuse me. so the next form of killing their prey in the snake world is another picture of a reticulated python. I know my slides 
That's okay. <laughs> so the next method is brute force. And brute force is different from constriction because they're not necessarily going to use their entire bodies to kill their prey. Now that being said, some will use constriction a little bit, but they're mostly going to rely on their grip. So when a snake is using brute force, like a garter snake or a king snake, they're going to bite onto their prey and either they're going to shake violently until it's knocked unconscious, or they're just going to go straight to the, to the business of swallowing it whole while it's alive. They are very rapid at just shoving it down their throat incredibly, incredibly quickly. So to help me talk about that, I have another friend on the show. We have a beautiful Pueblian milk snake. Now, probably milk snakes are part of the king snake family, so they use brute force in order to kill their prey. Now, these guys are going to be eating mostly smaller animals, usually juvenile birds, juvenile mice, maybe even some smaller mammals, some smaller reptiles. King snakes and uh, milk snakes and garter snakes are also known to very commonly eat other snakes. They are very quick at eating them. Now, this Pueblian snake is not going to be able to eat that ball python I just had out recently. Is they're going to have to swallow things that are about half the length of them in order to successfully swallow it. If they try eating anything bigger than them, it could literally kill them. Now you can see a great example of him flicking out that bifort tongue, so he's smelling the air, trying to learn what is going on around him. Now, probably milk snakes are also a great example of a new of a not. Uh, our Pueblian milk snakes also have a, uh, a, my goodness, I can talk today. Pueblian milk snakes are also a great example of a form of defense. Now, that ball python is called a ball python because if they get really scared, they tuck themselves into a nice tight ball and pretend that they're a rock and hope you leave them alone. Whereas milk snakes and king snakes like this fellow here, if they're, uh, or in this case with the Pueblian milk snakes, their defense is to look like a super dangerous, deadly snake. There are two snakes that look like this, the coral snake and the milk snake. Now there's a helpful rhyme to help us distinguish the difference between a milk snake and a coral snake. And that rhyme goes as follows. Red touches black, friend of Jack. Red touches yellow, kills a fellow. So you can sort of see how that rhyme kind of works with the banding right here. And you can see definitely using that rhyme that this is a harmless milk snake. He's not going to do any damage. He just wants to, to think he is a super deadly, super dangerous, venomous snake. But he is not. He's harmless. Instead, he just uses that brute force, bites on him to his prey, and shoves it down his throat as fast as possible. How long is that snake, Jordy? This snake is roughly about... Jordy's bad at estimation, roughly about three feet long or so. Um, this is full grown and not going to get any bigger than this. And that ball python also is not going to get any bigger. He is a male, so he's a little bit smaller naturally, and he's just not going to get that much bigger. The ball pythons are rather smaller species of snake, like the milk snakes. We have two more questions about that milk snake. All right, right I'll keep is it that up. A, is that a boy or a girl? <clears throat> Good question. Uh, I, it's hard to say. Um, the only way you can really tell the difference in gender with snakes is usually being very invasive or asking very politely. And since snakes don't have ears, they can't hear a single thing you ask them. So we don't really know. Now, I do know for a fact that we have two milk snakes on display. One of them is a boy, one of them is a girl. It's really hard to tell the difference between the two. And like I said, there's no physical difference between the two um, as far as the signs of being opposite gender. So I don't know if this is Claire or Roger. We really don't know. <laughs> but uh, if I were to look at the information, look at his, uh, uh, the sheet that would be able to clarify which one is which, then I could tell you. But I, I don't honestly remember which one I grabbed. But that's OK. That's OK. <laughs> um, and do we know why it's called a milk snake? Do we know where that name came from? That is a fun story. So they are called milk snakes because allegedly way, 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 way back in the olden days when farmers would see these guys crawling around their farms, especially dairy farmers, they thought these snakes were coming up to their cows, latching onto the udder and drinking milk straight out of the cow. Now that is obviously not the case. These guys are strict carnivores, as all snakes are strict carnivores. They're not going to eat any kind of dairy. They're not going to eat any kind of fruits or vegetables or anything like that. It is just an, a, a myth that was made up back in the day. Kind of the same way why corn snakes are called corn snakes. There is some theory that the corn, name corn snake came from farmers believing the corn snakes were eating their corn. 
but that's obviously not the case as well. They were eating the mice that were eating their corn, same as these things were eating the mice that were eating the grain of the dairy cows that lived in the farm with them. Okay, we should keep going. Okay. So, going back to the slide, we now have our final form of killing your prey in the snake world, which is probably another picture of a milk snake here. The, uh, but that is not a venomous one. And venomation is the final form of killing your food in the snake world. Now, we do have four different species of venomous snake here on this exhibit. Uh, now, we'll talk a little bit about them uh, in a little bit, but first we have to ask the question, what is the difference between venom and poison? Now, a lot of people get this very commonly mixed up. As you can see from that delightful picture, I love sharing it. That is a terribleus tree or poison dart frog sitting on top of a venomous eyelash viper. Now, the difference between the two of them is how they deliver their method. I have a great example, or um, sort of a metaphorical example here, to tell the difference. So let's say I were to pull out that milk snake and it bit onto me and I pulled it off and then I collapsed dead five minutes later, it was venomous. In contrast, if I pulled out that milk snake, looked at it and said, ooh, that looks tasty, and I gobbled it up and I died five minutes later, it means it was poisonous. So poison is ingested. It's usually secreted from an animal all over its body. Sometimes it's secreted from organs inside of its body, but either way, poison has to be ingested. Toxins ha or venom, venom has to be injected. It's not the chemical formula of the toxin, it's the delivery method. So venom is used by things like spiders, uh, they're used by scorpions, wasps, bees, some species of fish. There's one species of, of, of primate known as the slow loris that is venomous. But we're not talking about those animals, we're talking about reptiles uh, specifically. Uh, and specifically, we're looking at our venomous snakes here. So the next picture, if I'm remembering correctly, is an example of the venom delivery method right here. So snakes have a gland located in the roof of their mouth that produces the venom. The venom is then sent down little tubes to its fangs that are then injected and pumped into a prey animal when it's bitten. Venom is not used to kill something that they hate. Venom simply used to kill or immobilize their prey in order to make it easier for them to eat or to kill them in general. And again, making it easier to eat. So venom is going to be something that not a lot of snakes want to waste. They want to conserve it because it's a very valuable resource. It's like, uh, it, like, it's like energy. You don't want to waste too much energy. So they have that gland, they pump it down through their fangs. Now when we're talking about the fangs, there are three types of venomous snake out there. Like I said, there's a lot we're covering here. So the first picture is gonna be our first example of one of the methods of, venom of envenomation. This is a mangrove snake. And if you stay tuned to the end of the presentation, we have a video of this mangrove actually eating. So cool. But anyway, so it is, this is a mangrove snake, which is part of the colubrid group of snakes. Now, this is important to know that not all colubrids are venomous. Lots of snakes are colubrids. That corn, or milk snake I had out was a colubrid. Uh, garter snakes are maybe colubrids. I'm getting them mixed up. Hey, either way, there's lots of colubrid snakes out there. Not all of them are venomous. There's only a few venomous colubrids out there. The mangrove snakes are one of them. Now, the difference between this snake and other venom methods is that these are known as the rear fanged snakes. They have a fang located in the back of their mouth, but it's not very big, it's rather small. It's also not hollow. Instead, it is grooved on the back of the tooth. So when they are biting, they are gonna bite and they're gonna hold and they're gonna chew and chew and chew and chew and let venom drip down the back of that tooth into their, prey's, uh, into their prey's bite wound to hopefully immobilize them. Because of this, typically these guys are not the most venomous species of snake out there, but you always have to be careful of anything that has venom, and some of them are incredibly toxic. The mangrove, not so much, but they are still dangerous nonetheless. The next group of venomous snake are the elapids, and the elapids are my personal favorite group of venomous snakes. These are your front fanged snakes. These things have shorter fangs located in the front of their mouth that are almost completely hollow, and their uh, venom drips down that tooth into their prey, but these guys are gonna be strikers. They're not gonna bite and chew, they're gonna strike and wait for the venom to be effective. 
These make up your mambas, your cobras. King cobras, for example, is a great example. And this fellow right here on the screen, which is a red spitting cobra. So they have that venom and being a cobra, they are able to flatten the hood of their, or flatten their neck to make a nice, big, impressive looking hood. Now, those of you at home, I think that's actually everybody. There's, I don't have an audience here. But those of you who are watching this stream, raise your hands. I'm going to pretend I can see them. If you have seen an example of somebody charming the snake, you know, on TV, on a movie, in a video game, I don't know, in a book even, where a, somebody is playing an instrument and they're playing a great beat and they're rocking out to the music and they're swaying back and forth, but they're playing a great music. And then they have a basket. And they open the lid of the basket and the snake slowly raises itself, hoods itself nice and big, and focuses on that, that uh, musician and starts rocking out and is hypnotized by the music. And it's so hypnotized, the player can then tap it on the head or touch it in the nose or they can even put the lid back on the basket. Now the question here is, do, are the, is that snake being hypnotized by the music? Was that? I think I can hear everybody saying no, because if you paid attention, snakes are completely Death. They can't hear a darn thing that you are saying. That snake could care less what is coming out of that musical instrument. Instead, what that cobra is focused on is the swaying motion of that musical instrument. They are hooding as a defense. They want to make themselves look big and scary to any kind of predator. And they're going to focus that hood on the thing they perceive to be the threat. So in this case, it is the musical instrument. And they're going to stay so locked on that thing that's moving right in front of their face that they are completely unaware of anything that is going on. Now that is the secret between snake charming, but that being said, never, ever, 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 ever try that at home. One, we don't have cobras here in the United States, but two, it's always a bad idea because these snakes can always still pull out of that trance and then suddenly be aware of that you are there. But again, do not try this at home ever, 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 ever. But the elaphrids are the front fang snakes, which have short little fangs. Then you have the final group, which is the one that a lot of people know as far as the venomous snakes go, and that is the vipers. As seen here with our lovely Gaboon Viper we have on display, our Western Diamondback Rattlesnake, as you can see right behind me. These guys are known as the folding fang snakes. They have incredibly long fangs that can fold into the roof of their mouth. These things can get up to two inches long, especially in the case of the Gaboon Viper. These fangs are also pretty much like hypodermic needles. They are completely hollow on the inside. They are incredibly long and they bite and inject a ton of venom in a very short period of time. They are very effective. Things that are vipers are rattlesnakes. They are kaboom vipers. Well, vipers in the name there. But you also have cottonmouth snakes, copperhead snakes. A lot of the snakes that we have here in the United States are viper or venomous snakes are vipers. So it is always best to play it uh, safe whenever you don't recognize a snake, but that is the vipers. The folding fang snakes, the elapids are the front fang snakes, and the colubrids are the rear fang snakes. Now, when we're talking about venomous snakes, we then have to talk about, if my slide is correct, another picture of a Western of our Mr. Western right here. Uh, next picture is going to be snakes and safety. So here's the big disclaimer here. I am a trained professional zoologist. I am a trained zoological professional. I am trained to handle with these animals. So. Do not, do not, do not, do not try to repeat anything you ever see me doing, whether it's when you come here to the museum and see the exhibit and I'm working, or if you see a video of me handling one of these snakes. Do not ever try this at home. Again, I am trained to handle these snakes, and I have tons of training and tons of rigorous safety protocols that I have to go through. When I'm personally working with these snakes, I have a couple of tools that I always work with. One. I never, ever, ever just go right on into the snakes with my bare hands. That is a very quick way to get bitten, and these guys are very dangerous. I don't really want to go to the hospital. So I never use my bare hands. I always have a tool in my hands, and I have one of my most commonly used tools are the great snake hooks. So we have various size snake hooks. They are these tiny little things. They are a metal rod with a curved end. It is not sharp in the end. It's just kind of hooked a little bit. And this allows me to have some distance in between my hand and the snake and just scoop the body up very gently and put it down. We have snakes, snake hooks that are this small that we use for things like the green tree python, just to be safe. 
Most common one I use a lot is the ones that are this this big. This gives me lots of distance in between my snakes, like my uh, Gaboon Viper and my Western Diamondback Rattlesnake. Gives me a lot of control, and usually I have two of these in my hand at one time when I'm handling. And then finally, they also make snake hooks this big as well that allows me to handle very safely at a very, very far distance allows me to safely handle my reticulated python as well. Again, I don't want to get too close because these snakes could potentially harm me. So keeping as much distance between me and them as possible is ideal. So those are uh, some of the tools that I use. Another tool I get asked a lot is, well, Jordy, are you concerned about that spitting cobra? And the answer is yes. And thankfully, I have a special visor that covers my face completely. If the spitting cobra spat, it's going to hit this instead of my face. The spitting cobra is going to be targeting onto things like my eyes. They're not going to just kind of spray willy nilly. They're going to target my face. And because I don't want to go blind or become paralyzed, I'm going to have this visor in order to keep myself safe. Other tools I might use are specialized trash barrels in order to, to contain the animals that are uh, or specialized barrels uh, that are made out of trash cans that allow me to very con uh, securely contain and lock in my animals while I pull them off display when I'm cleaning. I'll also use um, uh, very long or uh, very heavy thick gloves if I do have to do any kind of level of handling. So there's lots of tools that I use in order to stay nice and safe. But again, I'm a zoological professional. I was taught how to do this. I was trained how to do this. This is my job to do this. You should not try to do that. If you see a snake out in the woods, if you know it or you don't know what species it is, if you're not sure if it's venomous or if you know it's venomous or not, always leave it be. Every snake you see out in the wild is more scared of you than you are of them. So keep your distance. I like to say if you're looking at a snake and it's staying put, stay at least somewhere between six to eight feet away from it and take a good, you can really get a good look at it from that far, but take a good long observance at it and then back away slowly and leave it alone. If you leave it alone, it's gonna leave you alone. Again, snakes are not gonna to want to attack you out of no reason. So don't try going up to them and poking them in the face. Don't try to catch them and take them home. That is never a good idea. Don't try to get really close and take a selfie with them. No, instead, always make sure you keep your distance, be respectful of that snake, and really all wildlife in general, give them their distance and leave them alone. So that is the uh, safety of the snakes. Now, that being said, we're now gonna look at a video, if we are all ready for that, of our mangrove actually eating. You're gonna see me using the snake hook in that video. And you're also gonna see me using the tongs. It is coming. There we go. So you can see I'm keeping my distance. I have the snake hook in one hand and I have a set of long tongs in the other hand. Then I have that frozen thawed rodent that has been thawed up to the same body temperature it was alive. And I'm trying to get that mangrove snake to bite. Now I am making it tap, uh, or I'm using the mouse to tap it on the body to make it remember, or uh, to wait to wake it up. If you guys remember, all snakes can't blink. So when they're asleep, their eyes are wide open. So I usually have to tap them to wake them up to let them know that something's going on. And I'm gonna keep tapping until he gets really excited. And you can see he is getting very excited right now. He's flicking his tongue quite a bit. It's really focusing and boom, he is lashing on. Now as a mangrove, he's going to hold on to that and then he's going to start chewing and chewing and chewing if it was alive. In this case, he knows it's not alive. So he's not gonna chew, but now I believe the video is gonna start speeding up and we're gonna see it him swallowing it pretty quickly. These guys do like to shove it down their throats as fast as possible. Um, you might see a little bit of chewing motion. That is not a snake chewing its food to make it easier to eat. It is simply it walking it down its throat. All snakes have fang or teeth that are curved, pointed towards the back of their throat that allows food to slide on in with no problem and prevent them from slipping out uh, with too much problem. Still working on it. Usually this will take this particular snake anywhere between say five to 30 minutes. It depends on if he wants to really take his time and savor the taste or if he wants to just, you know, if he thinks there might be a threat nearby, he may just hold on for a little bit. Um, and then once he starts going, he goes pretty good. He's gonna start shoving it down as fast as possible. So Jordy, as we're watching um, this snake finish its meal, um, do our snakes here in, on the exhibit, do they have names? 
So a lot of the snakes, um, some of them do, some of them don't. Um, that's a, kind of a trend of a lot of reptile keeping in zoos and even in the uh, private field as well. Some of them do, some of them don't. Um, in the case of the mangrove snake, the mangrove does not have an official name. Um, I call it mangrove because I'm real original with names. Then we have Mr. Western as well. We also have Jorgen, our gaboon viper. Um, our, uh, our milk snakes don't really have names. Well, I did say that their names were Claire and Roger. We have our garter snakes that don't really have names except garter snake one and garter snake two. And then we also have our reticulated python whose name is, uh, um, uh, is, is Blondie, if I'm remembering correctly. So yeah, so some of our reptiles, most of our reptiles have names, but the snakes don't really have a lot of them because a lot of snakes don't have a ton of personality, so you don't really get to know what they're going to be like. And uh, as a zookeeper, I try to prevent naming every single one of them because then it doesn't create as strong of a connection because I don't view these animals as my pets. They're not pets. They are wild animals that live in the zoo and I take really good care of them, but I don't want to start cat letting my guard down and treating them like I would with my cat or my dog or anything like that. So yeah, I kind of keep things a little bit more professional between me and the snakes. Great. Um, let's wrap up with, there's so many great questions. But okay. Let's wrap, wrap, wrap up with <clears> one more. Um, are any snakes poisonous instead of venomous? Yes, there is at least one species of poisonous snake, and I can't remember the species off the top of my head, but there is at least one scientifically confirmed poisonous species of snake that has toxins in its body, and if it gets consumed, it's going to poison the animal that way. Great. Fantastic. Um, so, we are so grateful that you're all here today. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to post up here on our screen. Um, we hope that you can join us again soon. We have a lot of live stream programs coming up. One tomorrow, we've got Fossil Fridays with our paleontology team um, from now to the end of May. So tomorrow you can tune in to uh, from the field to the lab and learn about what it's like to find fossils. Um, if you want to learn more about reptiles, Jordy's coming back next week. He'll be here next Thursday again to talk about turtles and tortoises. You can go to museumoftherockies.org slash learn for our full list of programs, a bunch of online resources, including a Kahoot quiz that Jordy just made for you for the program today, too. So thanks so much for joining us. We had a lot of fun. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and we hope to see you again soon.